came with specific instructions. Use it wisely. My grandmother said, it is only for the most special occasion. It had been a gift from her mother, who told her the same thing. Only for the most special occasion. I held it for years, not knowing what could be special enough for this. Until... It was six days before Passover. He was reclined, his feet towards me. Around him, his followers. I too was a follower, at first at a distance. But he invited us. The women, women, really everyone, to come near to hear his stories of God's curious kingdom. That night, I gathered my perfume from its safe hiding place. The room crowded with men. No one noticed me. Without hesitation, I broke open the lid of the bottle. The perfume drenched his feet. With a slight smile, he, he looked at me. And then, I did something I had not planned. I covered, I covered his feet with my hair, washing them with my tears. I had no choice. He was Messiah, worthy of anointing. This, this was the celebration that everyone hoped for, of who we hoped for. I kept the bottle and the memory. The perfume was not wasted. He, he was the most special occasion. I hope you enjoyed that video uh, put together by the skit guys and uh, the dramatic uh, reading or dramatic uh, portrayal of, of Mary. Uh, we're going to look a little bit into that uh, story from Matthew 26 uh, today. Have you ever noticed, though, that the word extreme seems to be a little overused? As I, as I think through that, that word, it gets thrown around a lot. We have extreme sports, uh, some of which are, are actually extreme. They're pretty intense. They're... they're uh, that are fun to watch uh, and, and fun to participate in, but, but we also have like extreme Doritos. We have uh, uh, Right Guard Extreme uh, and Deodorant. I mean, deodorant described as extreme is kind of wild if you ask me. Well, if you look up the extreme in the dictionary, it would say something like reaching a high or the highest degree. Uh, Dictionary.com says that it's the farthest removed from ordinary or average. Even though the word extreme gets uh, misused and abused, uh, today we're going to look at a woman, right, that we just, Mary, who we just heard from, uh, who was in many ways extreme. Her faith was extreme, and she displays her faith in such a way that it's light years away from ordinary or average. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. We're going to look at verses 6 through 3. Now, now, Matthew's gospel isn't always in chronological order, and, and this, in this case, uh, this is one of those cases where it's, it's not in order, or where, where it falls in Matthew isn't consistent or isn't, uh, isn't exactly the, the chapters leading up to this are a little bit out of order chronologically. And so this event takes place um, the Saturday before the triumphal entry, um, and so close to uh, the uh, time where Jesus would be arrested and uh, eventually um, put on the cross and, and die and rise again, which is what we're going to be celebrating here soon. Uh, then, so the day before uh, Jesus comes to Jerusalem, uh, he's, he's in a town called Bethany with his disciples, a uh, former leper, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And so I'm going to go ahead and read, I'm going to read Matthew 26, verses 6 through 3. It says, Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined. 
And when the disciples saw it, they were, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So we find out uh, in John's gospel, in John's account, uh, that this woman is, is Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, whom Jesus had previously uh, uh, raised from the dead. And we also find out in, in John's gospel that this ointment she washes Jesus' head and feet with is, is worth 300 denarii. Now, the Bible tells us that one denarii or, or a denarius is, is a day's wage. And so 300 is like a, a yearly salary or an average person's yearly salary. Uh, and, and I realize as a high school student, that's, um, that's probably difficult to comprehend. Maybe you haven't even thought about a yearly salary. But even if you think about, you know, if you have a job, what you make, right? So as a high school student, imagine you made $5,000 a year doing whatever, you know, Chick-fil-A, Culver's, wherever you're working, right? Imagine you made $5,000 in your part-time job. Imagine giving your year's worth of paycheck to God. You didn't keep any of that. Imagine you just, you just gave that all to the Lord. So even if you really love God, my guess is it would be difficult. It'd be hard to give that much. It'd be challenging to give something so valuable. So it's easy to see here why Mary's faith is far from ordinary. This, this is not average. Her extreme faith leads her to make a costly sacrifice. To make something that valuable and then, uh, and then use it to, to pour over Jesus' head and, and wash his feet over, it's just, it's over the top. Uh, it, this is not ordinary. This is not average. Washing a guest's feet was ordinary. Washing their feet, uh, if they were a guest in your house, uh, that, was, that was ordinary. Washing feet with something so expensive, though, was far from ordinary, and it was definitely not close to an average situation. Extreme faith leads to extreme sacrifice. Jesus sacrificed his life on the cross, taking on the sin, uh, the sin of the world, paying the price for our sin. And he, and he said, follow me. He said, follow him, and not only in life, but even in death. And we see this in the Old Testament, too. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, David wants to build an altar, and, and, uh, but he needs some land to do it on. And so he goes to this guy and to buy his land. And this is my brief summary here. And then that guy says, oh, I'll give it to you. Uh, and David says, no, 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 no. I will not give to God that which costs me nothing. David didn't want to sacrifice an animal that was given him or on land that was given to him. He wanted to give his gift. Uh, he wanted that gift to be costly and sacrificial. He wanted it to cost him something, so it was worth something. It was valuable. Extreme faith leads to costly sacrifice. This is why we can usually spot people who have, who have great faith in God. They, they're constantly sacrificing, constantly giving their time to, to serve others or, or give to those in need, even when they're not necessarily rich. They're just, they're just giving and they're pouring their lives out, investing in other people. Mary's extreme faith led to a costly sacrifice. But, but here's the real question. Why should I have faith like Mary? Or should I have faith like Mary? And if so, why? Why should I be like her? Why, why um, should we look at her as an example? I mean, Jesus says, uh, Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. He, he highlights this. He obviously, from Jesus' perspective, this is a big deal. And it's something that should be remembered. Uh, and so in verse 10, though, uh, it's uh, Mary, uh, Jesus says, uh, says this, but Jesus, aware of this, said, Why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. Uh, Jesus counts this act as beautiful. What Mary has done is beautiful. The disciples say, well, why this waste? Why this, this financial, this costly waste? And, and yet Jesus says, this was beautiful. And so uh, in life, that's, that's often the case, right? What other people see as wasteful as Christians, what things we spend our time on, spend our money on, or invest our money in, and give our money towards, the world often sees as wasteful, and Jesus finds it beautiful. Now, if God calls this act beautiful, even when others claim it's wasteful, I don't know about you, but I'm going to listen to his opinion. I want to listen to what God has to say about this. And if he thinks it's beautiful when I'm going, uh, then I'm, I'm going to take his word for it. I'm going to believe him, and then I need to figure out what it would look like for me to give a beautiful offering 
to the Lord. But as a Christian, knowing God sees this as beautiful, I not only want to take his word for it, I, I, want to, I do want to jot this down. I want, to, I want to remember it because if the God of the universe, the creator of mankind, says this is what I find to be beautiful, this is what I consider beautiful, that's something I think we need to take into consideration. We need to look at this and figure out how we can take what, what Mary's doing here and then model it and, and perhaps uh, figure out how we too can, can give and sacrifice and serve in a way that Christ finds beautiful. I think of it this way. If my wife tells me she really likes pink roses, like, and I know she loves pink roses, and, and she loves them, she loves the way they look, she loves the way they smell. If I know that about my wife, right, if I, if I, if I, if I know that she's told me that, if I, if I have like half a brain, uh, and even the smallest desire to show that my wife that I love her, I'm going to buy some pink roses. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get those. I'm probably going to get them regularly. I'm going to, I'm going to buy stock in, in some flower company because I want her to, to receive something that she actually values and appreciates, something that she finds beautiful. And so I think we should take note of, when we want to show our love for someone, what they find beautiful. That makes sense on a horizontal level from, from person to person, but also on a vertical level with God. This is something God finds beautiful. So if Jesus uh, finds this kind of faith to be beautiful, what does he think of my faith? What does he think of the way I'm living, the way I'm giving, the way I'm serving? Does he find my life as a beautiful offering? To him. If Jesus finds extreme faith beautiful, does he find my faith beautiful? What's most amazing, though, is, is although it was seen as extreme, Jesus wants it to be the norm. He wants it to be remembered. This isn't uh, an outlier. I think he wants us to remember it so that it is normal. It becomes normal. This is no longer viewed as extreme. Again, verse 13 says, Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Uh, this is not to be forgotten. I think it's not to be viewed as extraordinary. I think this is to become ordinary, that we are giving sacrificially to the Lord. Jesus is basically saying that when, whenever people talk about my life, death, and resurrection, when, when who I am and what I taught and did is proclaimed all over the world, don't leave this part out. Uh, I want everyone to know what this woman did and that I found it to be beautiful. And so this is an example for us to live by. This is something we need to consider as we think of the, the resurrected Christ and his gift towards us, of, of the gift of salvation that we're going to be celebrating. We should celebrate every day, but as we highlight in the days to come, I think we need to look at this gift right here and consider how we might give our lives back to the Lord. Imagine if our entire youth group displayed this kind of faith in Jesus Christ. What would, what would be different? What, how would our community be different? Even right now in this, these unique times, how would our community be different if, if us as believers showed this kind of faith, if, if uh, served and sacrificed and gave to this degree? How would it impact the rest of the church? How would your life personally be different? I want to encourage you to think about uh, Matthew 26, uh, leading up into the days uh, coming in here into to Easter, and I hope um, you're blessed by them and I hope you're challenged by them. Thanks.